And I'm looking for the first time at the image of a baby. I saw first trimester, so 10 weeks old, and you could see this newly formed little baby with arms, legs, this newly formed little face. Um, three and a half weeks preborn, the baby's heart is beating. Seven weeks, there's brain waves. Um, eight or nine weeks, you already have you know facial features forming. And this baby had been torn apart by the powerful first trimester suction abortion. Hello, Classic Crew, and welcome to today's episode of Let's Be Classic, featuring pro-life activist Lila Rose of Live Action. Let's Be Classic is a series on my channel where I get to interview some amazing people and have you get to know them in a more personal way. And I'm so excited to have Lila Rose on today's episode. Now, before we get into the interview, I would love if you would consider subscribing to my Substack. If you become a premium subscriber to my Substack newsletter, Letter, you will get access to exclusive content not available anywhere else, and it will come right to your inbox. You'll get two exclusive videos a week, a weekly article. You can also listen to a recording of the article if you don't have time to read it. And you'll be able to submit questions for live stream Q&As as well as content pitch contests. If you'd like to see more of what I do here on my channel and make sure that you do get access to all of my content, you can head over to the link in my description box or head to classicallyabby.com substack.com. Lila Rose is an incredible pro-life activist. Lila founded and serves as president of the pro-life organization Live Action, which has the largest digital footprint for the global pro-life movement. Lila's first book, entitled Fighting for Life, Becoming a Force for Change in a Wounded World, was just released, and I'm really excited for you guys to hear all about it, as well as her work in the pro-life movement, and also giving you guys an opportunity to get to know her on a more personal level. We're talking dating, relationships, fashion, beauty, and I'm really excited to share all of that with you. In addition, Lila's podcast is called The Lila Rose Show, where she talks about faith, relationships, culture, and politics. Lila has also done investigative reporting on the abortion industry, which has been published in many major news outlets. I had a great time talking with Lila. I think you guys are gonna love our conversation. And I'm really excited for you all to hear more about Live Action, her pro-life organization, as well as just get to know her on a more personal level. So make sure to subscribe to my channel so you can see more interviews like this. Make sure to ring that notification bell and let's get into it. Thank you so much for coming on today. I'm so glad you could join me. Thanks for having me. Exciting to do this with you. Yeah, I love, I love what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and I love what you're doing. I was going to say, it's so nice to have another vocal pro-life woman on my channel. I mean, you are doing so much for the movement and it is so important. Thank you. Well, I I mean, we're in it together, right? It's, it's not just one of us. It's the more of us, the better. And the good news is I love seeing more and more women speaking out to be pro-life and saying, you know, tr the true pro-woman position is being pro-child instead of, you know, pitting us against each other. So anyways, I, I love that you're speaking out on it. And so many other women, I feel like are doing that more and more. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a movement. It's a growing movement. Which is amazing. So I wanted to start off today talking about your new book. So exciting. It just came out. Um, can you tell us a bit about it? It's called Fighting for Life. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Yeah, so it's behind me. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> um, I have way too many copies of it in my house right now. They, they just sent me a bunch of my publisher, but I'm so excited to have it out. So it's been in a way 15 years in the making because I started my organization when I was a 15 year old. And then I've been praying and working and really growing it over the last 15 years. And now we are the global educational leader for the pro-life movement. So we're reaching about 15 million people weekly with pro-life education and content and inspiration. And so I wanted to write a guidebook for others who feel called or inspired to make a difference in the world, especially around a cause that might seem controversial or unpopular. Because I think that today there's some really crucial causes. I think the pro-life cause is the biggest human rights issue of the day, just the sheer amount of children killed by abortion and the devastation that it brings. There's been 60 million abortions in the United States alone since it became legalized. 
But I wanted to write something that would be that guidebook because I think a lot of people see the problems in our culture or they get inspired about something. They even get heartbroken over an injustice. And then they're like, okay, now what do I do? And, you know, they, they might feel a lot of insecurities or fears. And so a lot of the book is actually walking through the insecurities and doubts and fears and even my mistakes that I made building live action, you know, personal struggles that I was going through and providing tools and lessons for, okay, what do we do when we struggle with self-worth or other people's opinions or um, not sure how to get started or facing an obstacle that seems so great um, or other people are upset with us because they disagree. How do you navigate those situations and how do you ultimately in the process grow as the person you feel called to be, to be the best, you know, we talk about being the best versions of ourselves. I think that when we dedicate ourselves to a cause bigger than ourselves and fight for the lives of others, we actually are changed for the better. And so a lot of the book is about that too. That's fascinating. And I love that it's, you know, it's about, of course, your story and it's about the pro-life movement, but it's also really about being a tool book, a tool guide for people who want to get involved in things that it can be scary to get involved with when you're doing something that is, you know, controversial, like you said. So who would you say your book is ideally for? I mean, you kind of talked about that, but I'd like to hear kind of who you had in mind while you were writing it. Sure. Well, I think it probably is most resonating with um, a lot of young women. I mean, as a young woman and starting my organization as a young woman and being a boss and, you know, now a wife and even the experience of wrestling with career or calling and then also love and relationships. And now I have my son and I'm pregnant with our second. So that whole journey is present in the book um, and the lessons with that journey. But I've actually had men read it and younger men and I mean, people of all ages and they're like, thank you. I'm so pumped up and inspired. I'm so encouraged. So I hope it will resonate with different ages, different backgrounds. Um, But, you know, I think younger women, just because I'm a young woman, (laughs) um, they can relate to specifically some of the struggles that I share. And also just the, I think we're told as a society kind of how to be. And I know you address this a lot, Abby, which I think is awesome. You know, I think our society has certain expectations for what it means to be sort of a empowered woman. And I think a lot of those things are not true. I think to be empowered is to be um, pro-family, pro-love pro morality, you know, high standards for ourselves and others in a loving way, because that helps us be excellent as people. And so um, I think the book is, you know, the book is designed to encourage and inspire along those lines, because we can sometimes feel alone, like, oh, because I have these standards in my dating relationships, or because I'm trying to be this kind of a person myself, it's not what the world is telling me, like the world's telling me to you know, flaunt my sexuality or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I'm want to be countercultural. So how do I do that? You know, like, where's the, where's that encouragement for me? And, and so fighting for life is um, the encouragement for and the tools for how do you as a woman stand up in a culture that's often lying or misleading people and stand for what's right. Yeah, no, I mean, again, I think that that is so important for young women and really just people generally to hear and to to read and to have that um, boost from somebody who is doing it, you know, someone who's living that life. It's not just someone who they can't point to and say, well, she's not she's not doing that. But you have you've done it and you're accomplishing it. And it's incredible. So how did you decide that that was what you wanted to write about? And Have you, I don't actually know, I mean, this is your first book, so what was the process like for you of writing this book? So it was long and difficult. There were a lot of books I wanted to write, and I still, I'm actually working on another book already, so there's a lot of books, I think, in my soul. Ever since I was a a little kid, I'm like, I want to be an author. That was one of my, I think, first dreams, so it's very exciting to finally birth this, birth fighting for life. Um, I will say it's very hard to write a book. And I waited until I'm in my early 30s. I waited until I was, I feel experienced to really write about something that's useful for other women about how to fight and how to stand up for what's right. Um, I wrote this specific book because I really feel like we are at a crossroads increasingly. And I think that that's both politically and culturally. I feel that, and I mean, the last election was so crazy, right? (laughs) An unprecedented amount of people turned out to vote. Um, there were good people on both sides, um, a lot of concern over a lot of issues. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, during the pandemic, and then it was, you know, after the pandemic, during in the middle of a pandemic, and I had just given birth to my first son, and I'm working on this book, and I'm writing it, and I'm thinking, okay, 
it's more than ever, I feel there's this question of what really is right and wrong in our society, you know, who has the moral clarity? Because I think there were moral concerns on both sides when they went to the voting box during the last election. So it's like, how do we prioritize moral issues when we yeah. get into politics? How do we prioritize and, and even navigate our own personal lives uh, during unprecedented challenges? And I think that there's this desire, I, I feel like there's a desire from people um, in our culture today to just want to know how do I make my life happy? You know, what is, you know, how does, how do I make my life meaningful? And there's so many mixed messages. So anyways, fighting for life is what I've discovered. You know, first one fundamental principle is knowing our worth as individuals. I believe it's a God given worth and seeing the worth in others and putting others and, and the value of human life first. I mean, there's a lot of concerns. There's a lot of you know, interests like career and ambition and prestige and, you know, education and all these things. But at the end of the day, it's about love. It's about serving each other and becoming the best we can be. So a lot of the book is about how, you know, looking at political and cultural issues through that lens mm -hmm. and encouraging um, people and telling my stories to say, you know, I had to struggle with my own self-worth, um, mm -hmm. you know, as a young woman. And and some in some ways, my calling and even my cause to fight for the lives of preborn children and their mothers um, it, I couldn't really access that cause fully if I was at war with myself, right? And so a lot of it is working through the interior stuff that we should work through. And um, I think it's hard. It requires opening our hearts, getting vulnerable. So, you know, some of the book is about that process and why that's a process for, I think, all of us to go through it in, in one way or another. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that it's going to do great things for the people who purchase it. I'm excited to read it. I'm waiting for my copy in the mail impatiently. Um, we sent you one. Did you, you haven't gotten it yet, huh? It is in, is on its way. It is, okay. I've checked. Sorry, it's not there yet. <laughs> no, I'm very excited to read it. It is on my book list. I have to run and get it and I'm really excited to, to read it. So um, let's talk a little bit about your organization, your nonprofit, Live Action. So your history in the pro-life movement is amazing. You started when you were 15. Can you share your beginnings with those of my followers who don't know? Yes, I would love to. So I started Live Action, my nonprofit, when I was 15. We weren't really a nonprofit yet. We were just a student group. And it was born out of heartache that I felt and this moral clarity, this moment of moral clarity that I had which I really think was a gift at a young age. So I'll just share two quick stories. Um, and I talk about this more in, in Fighting for Life, but I was really interested in a lot of causes as a young teen. I was really, um, you know, one of those types was just very sensitive. <laughs> um, I know some people listening might be able to relate. Like you just kind of feel, you're kind of a, a, an empath. You feel deeply about the world and other people, you know, their struggles and injustice against them. And so anyways, I found out about abortion as a young girl when I was, becoming aware of a lot of other causes and really the, you know, the existence of evil. I think as a kid, you might think back to a moment when you really, for the first time, were like, realized that evil exists, that there was an, in, that there's injustice in the world. And maybe it was something that happened against you as a child personally, or maybe it was somebody that you saw being hurt or something you saw. But for me, one of those moments was I was reading this book because I loved reading and it was actually a, a history book on abortion. Um, weirdly enough, like I found my parents had tons of books in their house. This was one of them. I don't even know that they knew they had it. But mm -hmm. in the center of the book were images. And I'm looking for the first time at the image of a baby. I saw first trimester, so 10 weeks old. And you could see this newly formed little baby with arms, legs, this newly formed little face. Um, three and a half weeks pre-born, the baby's heart is beating. Seven weeks, there's brain waves. Um, eight or nine weeks, you already have, you know, facial features forming. And this baby had been torn apart by the powerful first trimester suction abortion, which is 30 to 50 times more powerful than a household vacuum. So it's really um, incredibly violent and it tears the baby out of the mother's womb and into pieces typically. And looking at this image, I was just heartbroken. I, I was just moved really deeply. And I, I just was like, is this real? Is this happening? What is this? And I learned that, you know, I kept reading at the time, there were 3000 abortions daily in America, that this um, was the most prevalent abortion procedure, this image that I was looking at of what had been done to this baby. And, um, and so, you know, I, I started to research and study the issue more. I came across Mother Teresa, 
who some of you might know about you. I'm sure you've heard of um, Abby. And she's this little nun from Calcutta, India. She worked with the poorest of the poor. Um, she worked with the total, totally destitute and she was a Nobel Peace Prize winner because of her works of, of charity and love. But she said, whenever she had the opportunity, she said, abortion is the greatest destroyer of peace. She didn't say racism or sexism or economic inequality. She, she made this distinction and she said, abortion is the greatest destroyer of peace. And I remember reading her words as a young teenager and just being really sh like shocked and surprised by that, that she would say that. Mm -hmm. And why did she say that? Because in an abortion, a mother is turning against their own flesh and blood. The bond of love that should exist between a mother and a child is broken. And the place that should be the safest, the womb, is become a war zone. And because of that, today we have 125,000 abortions globally every day. 125,000 abortions globally every day over 100,000 abortions every day in, 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 in our, on our planet. And, and it, it's, it's the leading cause of death. There's no greater death toll than abortion. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, learning about this, I was like, okay, I have to do something. And so that inspired me to start trying to find a pro-life organization to join because I thought this is the human rights issue of our day. I have to get involved. This is against women, against children, against society. Um, and Abby, there was no other, you know, pro-life youth group to join. Mm -hmm. I grew up in San Jose, California. So it's Silicon Valley, you know, near San Francisco, there's millions of people here and mm -hmm. there was no nonprofit to join to do um, education of my peers. So then I, I was like, okay, I guess I have to start it. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to just get together with some friends and we're going to start this organization. <laughs> and so that was the, that was the first step. Wow, that's an incredible story. I mean, it's true. When I, for me, the thing, I've been pro-life, that's probably been the issue I've been the most solid on my whole life. And it started for me in a similar way. I didn't see the the image of an aborted fetus, but just seeing the images of, a, of an ultrasound, of like 4D ultrasounds, and seeing the photography that they did in the book, like um, A Child is Born, where the you can see the baby's you know tiny little fingernails and you can see at like eight weeks that it looks like a baby i mean it was just it, it changed everything and i think i mean that's why they say right that so many of these um abortion clinics don't want women to get ultrasounds because as soon as a woman sees an ultrasound she sees her baby and that was how I, I felt when I would look in these books and I saw these images. So I, I totally understand. And then seeing what you saw at 15 of that same image, but now the extremely violent version, the horrible evil of that. I mean, I can imagine how that inspired you to start your own organization. Um, so as a pro-life advocate and the creator of the anti-abortion nonprofit Live Action, what advice do you have for those of us who want to be more involved in the movement? It's a great question. So I think first, it all starts with education. Uh, so educating yourselves, ourselves is the first step. And that includes, you know, studying fetal and embryonic development, looking at actually how abortion procedures are performed, uh, seeing how it affects women, like looking at the studies, the metadata of how abortion harms women psychologically, emotionally, a lot of abortion activists today are like, no, women are great after having an abortion. And the studies reveal that there's short-term relief that can come from the end of an unplanned pregnancy because you know it's seen as this problem and often women feel pressured or scared, but then it starts to sink in. You know, There's this deep, um, I think, ingrained trauma. I mean, that's a family member that was killed. Whether you identified him or her as your son or daughter when that child was killed, that was a life that existed that is now gone. And you were a mother for a short period of time. And that stays with you. And there's studies that show like as time goes on, how that trauma builds. And sometimes it manifests through addiction or through even suicide or other mental health crises. And so um, I think educating ourselves about this is key. Once we have enough, I think, confidence with our own education, which is key. I mean, if you're not feeling aware enough on the topic, you're not going to want to talk about it with other people, right? Mm -hmm. So Live Action actually has this online free mini course where you can learn pro-life apologetics or how to answer tough questions because a lot of society is conditioned 
to be pro-abortion, right? They're conditioned to say, well, my body, my choice, it's for women. And so you have to be prepared to give an answer. But once you feel, you know, you've done some research, you've started to explore the issue, I think simply sharing the message with one other person, maybe sharing on social media, maybe sharing with a friend, maybe sharing with a family member, um, then connecting with other pro-life advocates. Um, Live Action has an ambassadors program where you can connect with others. Um, we support students for life chapters so you can get connected on your campus or your college. And that's a key step because then you can start to team up. And I talk in my book, Fighting for Life, about the power of teamwork and how, you know, we're not meant to do this alone. You know, if there's a controversial cause that we need to fight, you know, in the past slavery abolition, that was this horrific human rights abuse in our country. And people bravely stood up. They, it cost them a lot but they banded together. They found that one other person who was willing to stand up for the rights of all humans as equal instead of permit slavery to continue. And so you gotta find in today's um, injustice, you have to find the people that are with you because it's gonna take it's gonna take some courage. You know, there's gonna be people that disagree and will mock you or misunderstand, you know, the issue. And so those are some key steps, you know, educating yourself, um, uh, starting to share the education that you now have with others, um, connecting with other pro-life advocates to team up and start forming clubs or, you know, joining pro-life groups. Um, and then, you know, along the way, suddenly you're part of this movement. And I believe it is the human rights movement of our day because of the, you know, the, the extremism of this, of this issue, the incredible death toll, the fact these are children that are dying. Um, it's done in the name of women. And we need everybody. It's a cause for everybody. So I would urge you to check out live action and please get educated and, and join the fight. Yeah, I actually, I believe in my pro-life video, I linked to live action because there is so much information available on the website. And uh, I think it is so important for us to understand what we're, what we're fighting for and know enough about it. So I think, and another thing that I think is exactly right what you're saying is, and something I try and do here on my channel, is creating a supportive community for yourself when you are trying to either make changes or just be a little bit more vocal about what you believe. And I think that having a community is what allows you to feel confident to go enough to, to go out and speak what you what you think and and make differences because otherwise going out alone, it's very difficult, it's scary, and it can make you feel like you're going to get canceled and you don't know what's exactly gonna happen. When you have some people kind of who have your back, I think that that really makes all the difference. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I think one other thing that helps a lot too, and I have a whole chapter on this in Fighting for Life, is heroes. I mean, I think heroes give us inspiration to stand up again and go against the grain. So who are your heroes? You know, for me, some of my heroes were Mother Teresa. I mentioned her earlier. She had moral clarity. She loved people sacrificially. She stood up for other people. Um, Corrie ten Boom was a woman, um, a Dutch woman during the Nazi regime when they basically took over her country and they were sh shipping off Jewish people and political dissidents to concentration camps and her, you know, committing horrific slaughter. And she stood up and she said, I'm going to try to rescue the people that are being horrifically treated. And she sacrificed so much. She was taken off to a concentration camp in the end for that. But uh, she did that because she she wanted to fight for other people's lives. And so having models of people, you know, who went against the system, who dared to speak out, who dared to be different, um, who loved sacrificially, you know, their focus wasn't themselves. It wasn't their own careers or fame or being, you know, having millions of followers on TikTok or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it was or being really gorgeous or like super fit. I mean, not that those things are bad, by the way, um, you can have millions of followers and be beautiful and super fit. Great. But what's your end game? You know, is yeah. your end game to serve other people and make their lives better and protect the vulnerable? Or is your end game yourself, which by the way, is not going to make you happy in the end, you know, that we're not made to just love ourselves and then stop there, right? We're made to value ourselves so we can also love others. Um, so anyways, that's, I think that's, uh, a, that's key to ultimately getting in the fight is having heroes that show us and model sacrificial love. I totally agree with that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the pro-life arguments. 
Um, so I, on my channel, I, I put out a, you know, I put out my, my fair share of pro-life videos and, uh, I actually did a response video to some of the comments in that original video. Of course, I got a lot of hate comments, so I was responding specifically to those. But I'm curious to know, what are some of the most common arguments for abortion? And how do you respond to them? Of course, we can go to live action. I'm, I'm going to recommend to all of my followers that you head to live action to get a more in-depth picture of this, but I figure this would also be great. We get to talk to Lila Rose herself, so I might as well ask. <laughs> Yeah, so I think as far as the most common arguments for abortion, I'll list a couple and then some responses. But there's mm -hmm. there's a lot we could kind of talk about this all you know all day. There's all kinds of different arguments or debates around this. But mm -hmm. I think one fundamental one, which you've I'm sure heard before, is my body, my choice. Meaning, I have bodily autonomy, and if I don't consent to pregnancy, then I have the right to end my pregnancy. Right? That's yeah. I think a very commonly um, made argument. And so, you know, in that case, I would say, you know, first of all, I actually agree my body, my choice in the sense that as a woman or as a, you know, a man, I think you should have bodily autonomy. People don't have the right to hurt you. You have the right to protect yourself. I, I completely agree with that. You should, you know, people should respect your body as I think we should respect our own bodies. When a woman is pregnant, there's another body involved. Uh, there's a child. Uh, an embryo is a is a human being. It's a unique individual human life. The science is crystal clear on this. Uh, science is crystal clear when human life begins. Embryologists, biologists agree. You can open a human biology textbook, and if you go back to the genesis of human life, you'll find that the beginning is a single cell zygote, a single cell embryo, which has the complete genetic material of an individual unique life. You know, eye color, sex, height, millions of characteristics are already decided. And that, that cell is self-actualizing in the sense that it's not being told by other cells what to do. Like our body, our cells communicate. This is, a, this is the whole body of the individual. And all that he or she needs is time and nourishment to grow. And she or she will rapidly grow if her life is not ended. Um, or his life is not ended. Three and a half weeks later, the, the, the tiny um, embryonic heart is already beating the nascent heart by seven weeks, six, seven weeks, brain waves are already forming uh, or firing. I mean, it's incredible how quickly this baby grows. So that being said, if you are pregnant, you do not have the right to end the life of your child, just as if you were a new a mother of a newborn and you were that newborn was totally dependent on you. You don't have the right to kill that newborn. A child's dependency, another human being's neediness doesn't give the person who is responsible for them the right to kill them. Right. And so because of that, that's why I'm pro-life, you know, and I think mothers deserve support. I don't think that means that every woman who's pregnant is able in the position to raise her child. That's why I think adoption is such a key part of the pro-life fight. And there's a lot of nuances around that. But the solution is never to kill. And I think we can all agree, and I'll, I'll just close with this as the kind of capstone of this response. We can all agree, and I hope anyone listening will agree with me when I say, it is always wrong to intentionally end an innocent, human, an innocent human's life. It's always wrong to intentionally end the life of a human being. And I hope everyone agrees with that. Um, if you don't, there's other problems, right? <laughs> um, and, and abortion intentionally ends the life of an innocent human being. And because of that fact, abortion is always wrong. So we should fight for mothers. We should care for children. We should improve the conditions, but we should never resort to lethal violence against a child, no matter how small they are, as a solution or as somehow a right. Yeah. So that's no, I one. I can do another one. I don't know how long we have. <laughs> but that's, I think, one of the most prevalent ones. No, I mean, you are absolutely welcome to give another. I think that's a great, a great argument. And I think it's so important for people to understand. Um, so that's up to you. We can, we can move on if you want, but you can give another. We can do, if you one, like. we can do one more because it's so common. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes from a very well-intentioned place. And that's the rape and incest uh, response. So some people who, you know, are maybe they're kind of feeling pro-life. I mean, they're, they're very open to the perspective. They, they care about human life, but um, it's so painful to imagine, you know, a rape or incest survivor um, carrying their the rapist baby to term. And I think that is a very common objection um, to say, well, we need abortions to be legal. And I think, first of all, it's important to note that one percent, um, even less than one percent of all abortions have to do with um, a child who's conceived in rape or incest. So the vast majority of legal abortions today 
over 2,300 abortions a day in America are elective abortions. So that means the mother just didn't feel she was ready or there was a boyfriend pressuring her. It had nothing to do with rape or incest. That being said, I think we have to really examine this question. If a child is conceived in rape or incest, does that mean that child is less worthy of life? Yeah. If you have a father who ends up in jail or becomes a mass murderer, does that change your value as a human being? So from the perspective of the rights of that child, that child is just as valuable as you or me, no matter who his or her biological parents are. And in the United States, we don't even give the death penalty to rapists. It's actually against federal law. So why would we give the death penalty to the son or the daughter who was conceived in an act of violence? And from the mother's perspective, the woman's perspective, I think we should have so much concern and advocacy for survivors of rape and incest. And we should fight for them and get the support they need and better penalties to protect them from their abusers, et cetera. But does abortion somehow remove the trauma of the rape? I think sometimes we think, oh, if we can just, you know, if she just has an abortion, it will, it'll, it'll help her, right? We want to help her, which is good, um, or help that survivor. But abortion is not going to heal the trauma of the rape. It's actually going to add another trauma to her, another wrong that doesn't make a right, which is ending the life of that child. And you would look up the few studies that have been done on this. There haven't been a lot. There should be more. But one study that was done on evaluating actually rape and incest survivors who got pregnant, some who chose abortion, some who had their babies, of the ones who chose abortion, the majority of them regretted it and wished that they hadn't. Of the ones who chose life, all of them said that this actually helped, was, was part of this sort of redemption despite the horror that they endured. And so I think we have to actually listen to the stories of what actually helps rape and incest survivors and then look at what is right, what is right no matter what, and that is never to take the life of a child, even if they're conceived in rape. Yes, I think that's a really important point. And I think it is really important for people because I agree with you. I think even though abortions from rape are the exception to the rule, that is still a question that people have. And I think it's important to address it because otherwise it seems like, you know, you're just waving it off. No one's waving off this issue. This is an issue that we, we in the pro-life movement have considered, and especially with the um, statistics that you're bringing up regarding the fulfillment that mothers feel when they do bear the child of their attacker. I mean, that's really important to note, I think. Um, yeah, cause, I mean, she's a victim, but I think there's a, there can be a certain resonance that your child's also a victim. You're both victims. You're in it together. And that yeah. doesn't mean you have to raise that child. It doesn't mean that you know, it, it does, it has changed your life fundamentally. I mean, that is a fact, you know, carrying a child to term, you know, being a victim and survivor of sexual violence. Those are, those are big things, um, big, big things, but that doesn't mean your life is over. That doesn't mean you don't have a future. And that doesn't mean that there's not redemption and that that child isn't, isn't worth it. Absolutely. So moving on to some lighter topics, I wanted to talk about you being a mom. So your son is about a year now and you're pregnant again. That's so exciting. <laughs> what has motherhood been like for you? What was pregnancy like? What is pregnancy like being a pro-life advocate? I mean, I think, you know, in my experience, when I, when I was pregnant, it felt uh, it was incredible. I mean, I could I could imagine everything that I was reading, you know, the, the development and I thought it was incredible. So I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, first of all, it gave me such a profound it, pregnancy now and pregnancy with my son. And I also did have a miscarriage um, several months back and each pregnancy and we lost our, our son. We named him Jesse. Each pregnancy has taught me even more profound respect for um, my body as a woman and just that I can create new life and I'm just doing, going about my day, doing my thing. And there's a life that is just growing rapidly in me, this, this beautiful human being. So I just am wowed by that. I think it's just crazy and weird and amazing. <laughs> uh, when you really like, think about it, you're like, wow, there's another human in you that's growing rapidly and you're just like living your life. <laughs> um, I mean, pregnancy also made me even more convicted about my work. Uh, oh my goodness, like w you have now this visceral reaction when I, you know, study abortion or debate abortion on, you know, me doing media or just talk about it. Um, 
I know, I know what it is to be a mother. I know what it is to have felt a child kicking inside of me and be, be completely dependent on me. And I know um, the violence that abortion is, you know, I've, I've studied it. And to think that we permit this, we celebrate this, we tell women it's good for them. It makes me that much more um, upset and passionate to stop it. So there's that element. And oh my gosh, there's so much more on like, just now like my son, so Peter is one, um, he's 16 months now. And just, you know, the wild ride of watching him grow, like it's people, people like, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, mom stuff of like, it's so hard and the kids are so messy and it's so crazy. And yes, it can get crazy and messy and hard. Um, I completely agree with that, but it's so beautiful. I mean, my son is just like, he's magical. And I know a lot of other moms see this too. Like when we, when we give ourselves permission to slow down for a second and just marvel at just um, how amazing these little creatures are, these, these, these humans entrusted to us. And I just feel privileged. I mean, I, I feel incredibly privileged with my son and now with our next baby and to have carried our other son for the short time we had him. And yeah, I'm just, it's just a blessing. And and then getting to watch my husband be a dad, like that's the other thing. Um, And I'm sure you'll just geek out, Gabby, when you guys have your, your next and watching your husband be a dad because watching the tenderness and, you know, marrying well matters. You know, the one, the one, the number one things I look for in a man was someone who really wanted to be a dad, you know, because I think as women, it's like, you know, is he, is he attractive? Like, yeah, make sure he's attractive. Do not be with him if he's not um, to you. He should be attractive to you. You know, is he kind? Is he hardworking? Like, yeah, sure. All those things. Is he fun? Um, but does he want to be a dad? Like, does he, does he love kids? Um, or does he want to love kids? Maybe he's like kind of, they're kind of foreign to him. And so watching my husband just like love on our son and play with him and just be a good dad. I mean, there's, it's pretty, I mean, it's obviously incredibly attractive and it's just beautiful. It's beautiful to get to see that too and see their bond. Yeah, absolutely. It's really funny because Jacob has been the one since we got married, who's like, let's have a baby. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Give us a second, but yeah, he's he's ready, to go. he's ready to go. No, he's he's gonna be an amazing well, father. I'm sure he will, and that's way better than a man who is scared of kids. I mean, and it, there's good to have some some healthy fear because it is like a it's a huge deal. Um, but I think this sort of like mentality of rejecting kids entirely because of fear or because of you know your own personal pursuits or whatever, you're just missing out on a lot of beauty, yeah. a lot of beauty. I, gr- I mean, yes, of course, I like can't wait to be, you know, a mom and I'm pregnant again. Um, but yeah, it's it was an incredible opportunity the first time. And now we're just waiting to to for the second time. So what books would you recommend for either pregnancy or motherhood? Did you have any books that you depended on or look to now or <laughs> anything like that? It's a great. So there's two that come to mind. I read so many books like all the popular ones, obviously, what to expect when you're expecting, bringing up baby, like all these like typical parenting books, a lot of Montessori books. I'm really into the Maria Montessori method about, you know, really self-directed, the child really self-directing their exploration as they're very young and growing and learning about the world. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's like, you know, having wooden toys and trying to avoid like things that are very unnatural for the child in their play space. Um, So that being said, the two books I found the most useful for me last you know, with my son, Peter, when I was pregnant with him, and now as, as, he, as he's a young boy, little boy, um, is number one, it's called Mama Natural. So it's kind of like what to expect when you're expecting. But for women who are pregnant, or if you have someone in your life who's pregnant, it's basically a more natural perspective on pregnancy. Um, and I'm not against, you know, giving birth in hospital, like I'm not uber crunchy or anything. Um, although my little sister did just like the midwife birth with the tub and everything like that. Um, so, but, but this book is really one step at a time through pregnancy and just recipes and different things about your body that you wouldn't typically know otherwise, or even your healthcare provider might not tell you. So it's really fascinating. So it's called mama natural. And then the other book that I found really great is called being there the importance of the first three years, which if you haven't read it, Abby, you would love it. And I would recommend it to any parent, mother or father or aspiring parent. And I actually read this before I became a mother. And I'm grateful for that. I, so if you're a single person, read this book, because I think um, anybody who just cares about kids and parenthood 
it's valuable. And so being there, the importance of the first three years is about childhood development and the power of the bond, especially the maternal bond with the child. And, you know, it's very relevant for adoptive parents or foster parents or really any parent. So it's very science-based. Um, the writer is um, using years of her professional knowledge as a clinical um, counselor and social worker describing, you know, childhood development. So highly recommend that one. Absolutely. Well, I have to check those out. I'm going to add them to my Amazon list like immediately. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about your faith journey. Do you, where did you start? Where are you at now? Kind of what was your story with that? Yes, yes, so it's definitely a journey um, ongoing because I think faith is, a, you renew it each day and oh, yeah. your relationship with God, you renew each day. But for me, um, I'll just share a couple markers in my journey. And I share some of this in Fighting for Life because I have a chapter called Let God Find You. Mm-hmm. And, you know, basically in short, I was raised in, in an evangelical home, so evangelical Christian. And there was a lot of beauty in that, you know, my parents taught us about love and God and we had our struggles, but there was just a lot of beauty in that upbringing. And then in high school, I just had a lot of rough experiences. I also talk about them in Finding for Life. I struggled with depression and self-harm and I had just existential questions about what it meant to be human and God. And I wasn't sure if what I had been taught growing up was true. And so I went through this phase where I really studied religion and worldview and belief. And I thought, you know, what do I believe? Is God real? Is Jesus God? Um, You know, what is the truth? And so that continued for some time. And then when I got to college, UCLA, I was really um, exploring Christianity more deeply. I, I came to a belief that Jesus was God. You know, I looked at the historical record of the life of Jesus Christ. We could talk about that in deep, you know, in depth if we want to. But long story short, I, I believed that Jesus was God and that I wanted to follow him and that he was really here to save, be the savior of mankind. Um, and I wanted to lo- learn how to love him and, you know, be, be with him in heaven one day. You know, I wanted to be saved by him. I was like, well, what does that look like to do that or to be that or to receive that? And so anyways, after even more explanation or exploration, I, I felt I began to learn about the Catholic church and how there's an unbroken line of what's called apostolic succession, which is, you know, Jesus laying his hands on the first 12 apostles who then laid their hands on their um, next in line uh, disciples who then laid their hands on there. And this is the line of the priesthood. Jesus is the first, the ultimate high priest. And then he ultimately is creating this line of priests in the line of Melchizedek, which is, you know, the Jewish priest. Mm -hmm. And he's basically transforming how we worship and what worship even is. And then he gives himself on the cross to die for us. And he ultimately leaves us the Eucharist, which the early church understood to be Jesus's body and blood. This is um, Holy Communion that we take as Catholics. So I began to learn all these traditions and the logic and the history behind it and how it made so much sense with against the words of Christ. Christ says all these very mysterious things in the Gospels that I never fully understood. But now looking at the tradition and how the early Christians understood it and looking at this 2000 years of Christian history, I was like, wow, it all of a sudden made sense. And then I started to explore the Catholic Church more. And I realized, you know, what it taught about the human person and God, um, you know, the, the magisterium of the church, so the official teachings of the church, which were unbroken and you know had been developing for 2000 years it was so beautiful and logical avi and Mm -hmm. consistent you know it 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 didn't go against science or reason it it, it invited in science and reason and it was just so coherent and beautiful and so i was like this makes so much sense you know and then with the eucharist you know learning about jesus and the eucharist that he left us his body blood soul and divinity and asked us to actually receive him in holy communion I mean, that was like the deal breaker for me of like, oh my gosh, I want to receive Jesus in this intimate way. So anyways, I ended up becoming Catholic in college and I'm still on the journey because I'm still learning how to be Catholic and how to just be Christian and how to, you know, be the best woman I can be and and let God love me and let God use me and become, you know, who he wants me to be. So I am a work in progress, (laughs) Um, but becoming Catholic was really the pinnacle, I think of that faith journey and really arriving into its fullness. And now I'm just, you know, becoming it more each day. Yeah, no, I love talking about 
faith as a journey because I know that I am definitely on on a path and it's something that I, I talk about very openly with my followers and my subscribers that, you know, I grew up Orthodox, I grew up Orthodox Jewish, and then I kind of, it's called going off the derech, which means going off the path. That's uh, that's the Hebrew uh, word for it. And I definitely did that when I was in my master's program, when I was in my early 20s. And now, um, as I met my husband, the two of us are kind of working our way back to being Orthodox again, but it's important to us that we do do that. But it, it's a process. And even when we reach the point, quote unquote, quote, of being orthodox, you know, it's always still going to be a process because you're always still trying to get closer to God and closer to exactly. quote unquote perfection. I obviously, none of us can be perfect, but we're all trying our best to aim for that standard. And it's always going to be a pursuit, not necessarily actually reaching that pinnacle. Um, so I love hearing other people's stories. Uh, but I had a question about being pro-life and being religious. And I think it's kind of clear that being religious would inform a pro-life position. But in my opinion, and I think most people would agree with me, that being pro-life is also the on only scientifically sound position. But how does your faith inform your work with live action, despite the fact that it isn't the, the main purpose of it, right? Like, we can sit here and say that there is science behind what we think. So what, what, right. how does your faith come into it, if it does? Right. It's a great question. And, you know, I don't, I, first of all, I think the science is on the side of the pro-life side because of the uh, reality of when human life begins, but science doesn't teach morality, right? So science teaches us or shows us about the world around us. You know, we can test and study and say, this is, you know, how, you know, gravity operates or how, you know, this tree is gr growing or, you know, about this disease or whatever. Um, science doesn't tell you what's right or wrong. And so everybody ultimately discovers a belief system or moral code. And I think that the most um, true and consistent moral code is given to us by a God. <laughs> um, there, go, there comes religion. And I think it's written on the human heart. So even if you don't believe intellectually in God, I think there's something deep in every human person that we can see, oh, it's, it's wrong to kill somebody, right? It's wrong to cheat. It's wrong to lie. And so um, that to say, you know, my faith deeply inspires my work. Um, Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of laying down your life for others. He laid down his life for me and I believe, you know, humankind. Um, and he shows me by example, how to live. And he gives me the opportunity to love. Um, but I would say, it doesn't matter your religious background or what you, where you're at in your journey with God, or if you even are wrestling with, is God exist? Um, you can all agree that there is an absolute morality and that morality includes it's never right to kill an innocent person. So in that sense, faith inspires me. But I, I was pro-life even when I didn't know what my faith was. You know, yeah. I was hardcore pro-life um, even when I wasn't sure if I even was a Christian or if I was anything, you know. So I don't think that you're precluded from being pro-life if you're not religious, which is awesome. We have pro-life atheists and, you know, pro-life agnostics and every kind of pro-life. Um, but I do think my faith has made it that much more deeper. And, and also, I will say, I believe there's something called God's grace. And that means, you know, God gives us all special help. He created us. He loves us, I believe. And so I do think God's grace sustains me because I, I will say the work is very hard. I mean, everybody has hard things in their life and I've, you know, had different struggles. And I, I, I think God, um, his particular love and the way I can receive his love through my faith has been essential <laughs> for me. So that in that sense, it's, it's helped my work tremendously. I think I love that. I love that last point that at least for I agree with you because I know that my faith in God bolsters me in the times that are difficult when you are coming up against a challenge. Um, so switching topics entirely, um, let's talk a little bit about beauty and fashion. Part of why we do these uh, these interviews is just so that my subscribers and followers and your subscribers and followers uh, can kind of get to know you just as a woman. And uh, I wanted to ask you a couple questions. So you are beautiful. Um, do you have any skin? Also you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any skincare products that you use and would recommend? Because clearly your skin is great. So <laughs> that's so sweet. Thank you. And also to you, a beautiful woman. Um, 
skincare products. So my favorite skincare product is one that my sister-in-law introduced me to years ago, and she is the skincare product guru. And it's kind of affordable, I think. It's called Paula's Choice, and it's this moisturizing daily sunscreen. And it's basically my daily moisturizer, as well as my sunscreen. I, I'm kind of a minimalist with my um, beauty products. And so anyways, and it's also based for makeup, but it's just sensitive skin, Paula's Choice, um, sensitive skin, daily sunscreen and moisturizer. Mm -hmm. And it's awesome. It just, it goes on really well. It's, um, you know, it's long wearing, it's very light. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't, it's not greasy or cakey and it gets the job done of both a moisturizer and a sunscreen. I'll have to check that out because I'm always looking for, everyone should know it's important to wear daily sunscreen. So I'm always looking for a daily sunscreen that I can wear that will look good underneath makeup. So it sounds like this fits the bill. <laughs> I think so. It's working great for me. So I would recommend checking it out. Okay. And you can get it on Amazon. It's not like one of those spoofy products that you can only get at like Neiman Marcus or, you know, right. Sephora. You can get it, I think, really anywhere. So perfect. And then as far as style, um, again, you dress really beautifully. So do you have any style icons? How would you describe your style? Hmm. So it's definitely evolving. Um, it's evolved over the years. I, I think I aim for and what I'm attracted to style wise is, um, you know, very classic, you know, tailored type pieces, but that have kind of a modern edge or sort of an interesting artistic vibe occasionally. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, lend some room for creativity or personal flair, what you're feeling that day. I'm definitely not trendy. Like I don't, you know, I, I appreciate the trends because usually trends are just like, they go in and out, right? Like what what's popular today was like popular in the seventies for your, your mom or something, right? That's like <laughs> trends. Um, there's rarely something new under the sun in fashion. It's always kind of recycled, even like from thousands of years ago, I've actually, I, I love studying fashion. It's interesting to me. And you look back like hundreds of years and like, we're at some of our, like, like the puff sleeves, that was, that was a thing, you know, a couple yeah. hundred years ago. So <laughs> it's like not, you know, we don't invent it today. So anyways, it's, it's all interesting, but so yeah, my style would be pretty classic and um, tailored and everything, but with sort of a little edge or vibe that I find interesting. And then as far as like a classic a style icon, um, that's been really hard for me over the years because I, I definitely think there's a lot of women who dress beautifully, but as far as like, I really like, I love what she, most of what she wears. I don't know that there's one um, historically that I, I mean, one person that comes to mind, which uh, I think she does when she became princess, she did a phenomenal job. And she, I think she still is. I mean, she's not really living the princess life, but I think Meghan Markle has done a really beautiful job when, she, especially when she was in Great Britain and doing the whole, you know, princess routine, she really nailed almost all her outfits. So mm -hmm. I think she's an icon, a modern icon today in what she's done and accomplished with her fashion. Cause yeah. it's like, it has a modern edge to it and it's interesting, but it's still super tailored and classic. Um, I think Kate as a style icon is also amazing, but she's more, much more traditional, I think not as creative. So I, I like the, the Markle side of fashion. Oh, I see. I totally see what you mean. Some of Meghan Markle's dresses, they have these very cool architectural designs to them that don't detract from the femininity of the look, but they definitely add something a little bit different. And I know what you mean about Kate Middleton as well, that she's more on the traditional side. I would say that I, I like both a lot. And I think I tend to be a little bit more flexible with trends and incorporating them into my outfits. But as a general rule, I don't I don't tell people that they should follow trends because I think it's most important to find styles that actually work for you specifically, right. as opposed right. to trying to just kind of follow what's popular. And three quarters of the time, man, that stuff does not look good on me. So I, <laughs> I can understand why it wouldn't look good on most people. These things are just... Well, and I and I think that's so good, like wear what you do feel confident in. And, you know, I think our bodies are so beautiful and human beings are so beautiful. I mean, there's whole like industries built around selling images of human beings bodies because they're so beautiful. That's why like sex sells because, right. you know, human faces, human bodies, we're just designed to just find them beautiful. And I think that's a good thing. Obviously we should approach it with this respect and even reverence because beauty should inspire respect as opposed to like wanting to consume or use other people. And so anything going back to clothes, I know modesty is a passion of yours, which I think mm -hmm. is awesome because modesty is not about um, 
you know, hiding ourselves or not, you know, not valuing ourselves or just being ashamed of sexuality or something like that. I mean, really it's about valuing how beautiful we are and showcasing it in a way that is tasteful and ultimately um, respecting, you know, our sexuality. Because I think if you kind of like sell your own sexuality, um, it's, 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 it's not doing yourself a service. So in that sense, I think also like classy clothes um, and there's a lot of like gray area here, you know, I'm not like a prude of like, you don't can't wear sleeveless shirts or like, you know, whatever the, the like, you know, stereotype is, but I do, I, you know, class, this idea of classiness is a lot about, um, respect for the, and, 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 and a kind of a reverence for how beautiful we are and wanting to, um, you know, have clothes that are worthy of our bodies, you know, Absolutely. like you have to be worthy enough for us, <laughs> which is like clothes that we do feel beautiful in and do showcase us. I totally agree. So the camera died, but we are back and we are going to be talking a little bit about dating and relationships. So can, what are your thoughts about dating and relationships? What, advo what advice do you have for young women who are dating? So I have a lot of opinions um, because I went through the the like slog of dating all through my twenties and had so many different boyfriends. And it was just, it was a lot. I learned a lot. It was like boot camp, And so I have a lot of opinions. Um, I actually talk about this a lot on my podcast. So I launched the podcast because I actually wanted to talk about dating and like mental health and things like that. So you guys can check out some of the episodes. Um, I'll just plug it, the Lila Rose show. But one of the principles of, for dating that I think is um, really important and essential is what's the point? What's your goal with dating, your personal goal? Um, is your goal like you're feeling lonely and you want to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Or is your goal, you just want to get to know somebody and just kind of see what happens and it's sort of like loosey goosey, like whatever, you know, wherever it goes. Or are you really wanting to have a long-term committed lifelong relationship, a marriage one day and have a family? You know, is that why you're dating? And I think it's important to kind of separate out the different um reasons we date maybe we even date because of peer pressure or we just find ourselves attracted to somebody when those things are not it's not bad to be attracted it's great but I think there has to be a goal with dating um not in a crazy way where you're like date one and you're like should I marry you or not I mean obviously not like that but you should have in your mind you know what's my goal here of being in the dating place market um when I get into a relationship as a boyfriend or a girlfriend you know am I just going to sit in that relationship indefinitely and just see well magically does it end up somewhere or am I wanting to see, is this the person I want to spend my life with? You know, is this the person I want to be the mother or my father of my children? And I think the key word in all of this is intentionality, having intention. And I think this is key for men and for women. And if you're a woman of intention who knows, you know, who she is, who she wants to be, what she's looking for, what she wants in her life, and you're looking for a man who is like that too, you are more likely to find that. If you go into dating and relationships with like out clarity on what your goals are and your intentions are for yourself and others, then I think it's going to actually, it, it'll probably be less satisfactory. And, you know, there's, there's more room for dating duds, quite frankly, and like, you know, having bad experiences. And so for me, as, as much as there were challenges through dating for me and, you know, great moments and tougher moments and all, all through my twenties. I did have the clarity of like what I was looking for. And that would change over time as I got to know myself better and, you know, understand like what I was looking for better. And that's one of the values of dating. You kind of refine what you're looking for. Um, but ultimately, you know, when I met my husband, Joe, if I had met him 10 years earlier, I don't think I would have had the clarity and the maturity because I was still learning that through my 20s. I was on an intentional journey, but I was still learning. And so in that sense, I think dating really prepared me for him. Um, and help me see like the value and the beauty that was my husband, you know, and, and made me want to marry him. Obviously, I was super attracted to that is very important. Um, but I want to say one other thing and my last like advice, big advice on this is, I do think it's so important um, to have your morality set on sex too, because sex can so color and change how we view our relationships. And, you know, infatuation is real. It's not bad, but it's real. And that can really make us, you know, bonded to or committed to someone that we're not ready to be with, or it's not right for us. And so I'm very much too, this is like the old school, maybe it sounds old school, but I actually think it's really revolutionary today. I'm very much about sex is within marriage, it's with your lifelong um, spouse, and it's when you're ready to have kids. 
And I know that's super countercultural because today it's like, what's the big deal? As long as there's consent, sex is fine. But I'm very much of a romantic and I'm very much of a, a believer in true love. And I think that, you know, true love involves your whole body, your whole self. And that should not be just given to, you know, a boyfriend or somebody you're dating. It should be given to someone who's committed their life to you. So that's another thing I'm passionate about with dating. Yeah. And marriage no. and the whole conversation. I think that those are incredibly good points. I make them myself. I really, and I, and I would love for my followers to fo listen to your podcast. I will link it in the description, the, I will link it in the description box below. Uh, but I think that exactly right. Intentionality is incredibly important. And I think what's very often misunderstood is the idea that we're bossing people around with these kind of, with these kind of concepts. And in, when in fact, it's really about, I don't want you to be in pain. The, if you date and you marry someone and you haven't thought about, you know, what that marriage is going to mean besides just attraction, besides just chemistry, which again, super important. But if you're only going in with those two things at the forefront of your mind, things may not work out and you'll be the one who's in pain afterward. And so in my, in my opinion, when I talk about these kinds of ideas, intentionality and waiting to have sex until you're married, it's because I don't want you to suffer. I don't want the girl who who does date a guy for five years and doesn't end up marrying him because, you know, he didn't ever want to actually take it to the next level right. to be to suffer. And that's that's where it comes from for me. So I agree with you on 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 both of those points. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's a beautiful point. And I I think it's too it's about um somebody who wants what you want, you know, what is friendship at its deepest core? What is chemistry at its deepest core? It's somebody who's like really running the same direction as you and like wanting the same things you want for your sake and for their sake. And so that's where shared values is really important. Um, not just shared values about like what you like to do for fun or, you know, you're not bad people. You try to be honest and, you know, hardworking, but shared values in terms of like, what do you want for your future? Um, what do you want for your fa future family? What do you want for your, your, you know, wh what's the purpose of your life? What's the big goal of your life? Um, is it, you know, to love God and other people? Or do you have some other goal? You're still figuring it out. And so I think having that alignment and one of the biggest alignments my husband and I had, you know, we had many alignments when we were dating and discovering each other and, you know, falling in love. And one of the biggest alignments we had was this view that marriage was forever. You know, we're both 100% against divorce. And that's really, um, I think, misunderstood today. A lot of people are like, well, you, if you don't like each other or you, if there's, you know, big issues, you probably should divorce. And we were really committed. No, when we promise each other till death do us part, we mean it. And we're going to fight for each other. And I think I had so much confidence in him that he would fight for me. And I know he has so much confidence in me that I would fight for him. And that was a big part of discovering each other and the commitment we made to each other and one of the reasons I chose him, like, there's no prenup, you know, there's no like, well, if it doesn't work out in the future, we'll divorce. It's like, no, we're in it together for life. And there's so much, I think, beauty in that. Absolutely. And I say something I've said at a couple of weddings, definitely to friends who are getting married, is you don't, you choose love every day. Love is not something yeah. that you just feel. It's not just something that happens to you. When you get married, there are days where it's not going to be easy and you choose love every single day. And that's how you have a marriage that lasts. And yeah. so I definitely agree that it's not that my husband and I very much feel the same way. And that's how I knew that I trusted him and I trusted us to get married was because neither one of us was ever thinking divorce was on the table. It was... Yeah. When we get married, this is forever. We're going to choose love every day. So, and feelings feelings come and go whether because you there's something you find you don't like about your spouse, you get annoyed or you have disagreements or misunderstandings or, you know, you just change as a person. And, you know, that is part of life and that's the power of choice. And our feelings do ultimately get connected back to our choices. Like if we're choosing and practicing in our own minds to understand our spouse and to forgive and to love, feelings will come, you know, feelings go, but feelings come. And so I can say today, I have more passion and love for my husband than I did when we got married. That's not because it was like this steady, like, you know, linear passion growing, you know, there's definitely been moments where we had hard moments already. And, you know, we're three years in, but that's normal. That's being human. And we shouldn't be, we should be afraid of that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So how did you and your husband meet? So we met through my brother. Highly recommend getting introduced by your brother. <laughs> um, he, my brother is also Joe. So my husband's Joe and he's Joe. And they were working at the same, they had the same um, job, you know, working, they were co 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 colleagues. And um, they're, they found out that they're both the oldest of eight kids. So mm -hmm. my husband's oldest of eight, my brother's the oldest of eight, and they're both Joe and they have the same similar jobs and they're <laughs> both from the Bay Area. And so <laughs> they're both like tall and handsome <laughs> um, and athletic. And so anyways, my brother, I had actually just moved back. So Abby, I was living in DC. I think you're in DC now, right? Right outside of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a super fun city, but I was like burnt out. I'd been there for over four years and I'm like, I miss California. So, and I also had the sense, like, I'm going to meet the guy in California. I just had this sense, you know, I, I was, I dated a lot in DC, you know, didn't, didn't work out. And so I moved back to California for live action and to be closer to my family. And two months later, um, and my husband actually, Joe, you know, I didn't know him yet, but he had been in the Navy and he had been traveling the world, serving our country. And like, he'd been all over the planet, literally. And then this was his second career now. And so he had actually just moved back to the Bay Area too. So we had both just moved back. Um, he'd moved back like a year before me, I think. And then, you know, two months later, I meet him. My brother introduces us and the rest is history. It's amazing. I love that. That's the best. I, we were introduced by a mutual friend, not my brother, <laughs> but a mutual friend. <laughs> what did your brother think when you when started you dating Jacob? your husband? Well, I think, I mean, they, they definitely liked each other and Jacob is as conservative as the rest of my family. So that was great. He fit right in. Um, my husband talks a bit more than my brother does. Surprisingly, I suppose, if you listen to his podcast, <laughs> but I think my brother was kind of taken aback because Jacob is a uh, loquacious, which I love about him, but it's, uh, he definitely does have a lot to say. So it was, it was a little funny, but also what my husband and I, we went very quickly. So we dated for five and a half months, got engaged, and then we're married, uh, one day under a year from having started dating. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think my family was mostly just kind of like, oh, this is happening quickly. <laughs> I guess I guess he's in the family forever now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was pretty quick. I mean, we 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 decided, I think we pretty quickly into the relationship because we both like knew what we were looking for. We de both dated a lot. And so I think we knew pretty quickly that we wanted to marry each other. It took a little time to sort pieces out. But it's kind of similar. And my, fam my family, though, is really pro Joe, you know, because he was so like much like my brother Joe, weirdly. <laughs> so they were just like, he's great. He felt he already kind of felt like family in a way, which was, yeah. which was awesome. That is the best. Yeah. And I'm so happy because my family, everyone gets along so well. So when yeah. my and my husband gets along with my parents and I get along with his parents, it's I always make the joke that we will call each other's parents just for fun, like while we're driving, just to say uh -huh. hi. And I know a lot of people have, you know, some tension between their in-laws and uh, that's just not been the case for us. Thank God. I feel very blessed that that has not been our situation. <laughs> that's awesome. So work-life balance. You are, you know, a mother, a wife, and you run this amazing organization. So how do you balance life and work? And what has stayed the same or changed since becoming a mother? Mm hmm. So it's definitely changed the way I see time. I was already trying to be productive with my time before becoming a mom. But now I'm even more sensitive to, you know, when I'm with my son being present to him or trying to just be with him. And then when I'm doing my work, just focusing on my work. And I mean, time blocking is what they call it. Like, I'm going to do this uninterrupted. And then I'm going to break and I'm going to just go have lunch with my son or whatever. Um, so it's definitely taught me even more time focus and focus time. Um, I'm also surprised at how much I can get by with less sleep. <laughs> um, I slept a lot. I realized when I was like single and didn't have kids, I'm like, wow, I, I'm okay with six hours. I'm doing this. You know, it's, it's life is still great. I'm still working it out. So that's a work in progress. So it's always going to be a work in progress. Like there's, it's like the dance, daily dance of figuring out life. But um, I think time blocking has helped um, delegating and asking for help, like ask going out of my way and like asking, you know, my mom, you know, she lives an hour away, but mom, can you come over this day to help with Peter and like, you know, be there for him. And I have this busy work day. Um, that's been really, um, 
important for me in a change because before I was pretty independent. I was very independent. I didn't really ask for help very much. So asking for help more as a mom is something I've learned. Um, I think also delegating my work to other people. So, you know, there's parts of live action that I did where I would just work, you know, 10 hour days and I would work on the weekends. And now it's like, no, I want to be present for my family. Like my family comes first, actually. And so in order to make that possible, there's a lot of other amazing people who are on my team. And I know not everybody has this option with their jobs. And I'm extremely grateful that I've, I kind of focused on building live action so that when I would become a wife and a mom, I would have a team who could do the heavy lifting. I mean, who could really do so much of the work and I'm still working hard, but I, I'm limiting my hours. So that's been another key to, um, you know, having that focused time as a mom and being able to be there for my family. Yeah, I think the I always ask, you know, the women who come on my channel this question because I think this is something we're all trying to figure out and I mm-hmm. I like to be realistic about it because I think very yeah. often you're told by this feminist narrative that you can do it all yeah. and yeah. no one no one has that many hours in the day. So yeah. how yeah. do we ha- how do we figure it out? How do we And there's, it- there's a there's a team behind you. I mean, if you see a woman who's like doing it all, like she has kids and a full-time job and she has, you know, all this amazing career and like, you know, she always looks super put together and all of this stuff, like she's not doing that all by herself. She has right. people helping her with her kids. Um, you know, she probably has um, people enabling her to take time for her own physical care, you know, <laughs> like there's, there's, there's a village and you know, I, I think it's all the more made me all the more passionate to try to help other moms because some moms don't have that village, you know, especially like single moms. I have so much more respect. I mean, I respected them a ton before having babies, but now it's like, wow. I mean, look at what you do um, or moms that don't get a lot of help from their partners, maybe, or whatever it might be. And so I think it also um, reminds us the importance of helping each other and trying to go out of our way to serve each other. And then also to know that no woman is doing it on her own you know, we need help in order to, to do it, you know, to, 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 to be the mom and to be the boss and to be the different things we're, we're going to be. Absolutely. I mean, community is everything. And then of course you have family and friends and, and recognizing, like you said, that it's not you taking it on alone. And then the women who do, we need to be there for, we need to figure out how we can help. And And not uh, to prepare yourself too, because I think, there's a temptation to see the woman that looks like like on Instagram and she's like perfectly dressed and like the kids always look so perfect and she has this amazing lifestyle and job and you just, it all looks so perfect. And keep in mind, like you don't see what's behind the scenes and you don't see the help that she does have. You know, you don't see the kind of the, 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 the things behind the scenes that are enabling her to do that and the struggles that she has. So it's also just important to, I think, not compare ourselves. And it's harder as a mom because you're like, how do I be a good mom? And you're like looking at other moms, like, you know, scrolling around like the mom Insta feeds, like, how do I, what do I feed my son for lunch? That's the most healthy meal, you know? And it's like, you know, step back a little bit and just do your best, right? Do your best, be confident in yourself. Um, You know, you're blessed, you're gifted, you can do this. And I think that also is an important message for moms. Totally. And for- <laughs> <laughs> so my last question today is, dealing with the hate that you get because being a conservative influencer i get a lot of hate for being openly conservative and i know you do for what you for your uh, advocacy organization for pro-life organization for you know everything that you work on i think my subscribers would love to know how do you deal with it so it's a great question um i actually talk about this a lot in fighting for life, I, I just spent a year working on describing what I do when I face attacks, you know, because I, I think it is a, it's, it, I think it can be re- preventing people from even being open about their beliefs because they're afraid of the pushback. And that's so sad. You know, you have a belief, you have moral clarity on something and you're afraid to say it because people are going to get mad at you. So I, I totally can understand that. Um, a couple of things that have helped me is number one, recognizing and and focusing on what I'm fighting for. You know, why do I believe what I believe? Um, Why do I want to stand up and and fight for this cause or, you know, have this conviction? And that really 
is a courage booster because the person like with abortion, there's 2,300 children who are in danger of being killed today. Imagine if 2,300 toddlers were being taken to be killed in centers, legalized killing centers around your community. That would get you out of bed to want to go fight for them, even if it was unpopular and even if you get pushback. And so knowing that there are children just as valuable as those toddlers, just younger and smaller who are being taken to centers to be killed, I mean, that that gives me courage. Um, heroes, I mentioned that earlier, heroes give me courage, knowing the people that inspire me, that went before me, that sacrificed so much, um, like Mother Teresa, I mentioned her, Corey Ten Boom, um, other people that, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., obviously, like he went and sacrificed, he went to jail for what he believed. Um, it takes courage to stand up in the face of attacks and having those people as models helps. And then another thing is um, being gentle with my own feelings. Like it's okay to feel afraid. It's okay to feel insecure. Um, don't let it stop there though. You know, we can still make choices no matter how we're feeling. There's a lot to be said for standing up even when your knees are shaking, right? And so when you do stand up, when you do speak out, even if you're a little bit afraid, you build courage for the next time. I mean, courage is a virtue, which is like a muscle. You have to practice it to grow it. And that's a daily choice, even when it's hard. It's like getting out of bed on time or going to the gym or eating healthy food. It's just doing it even when it's hard. And to empower you to do stuff when it's hard, having a team or having one other person who's trying to do what's hard with you makes a huge difference. That's why we have like fitness communities online where we're like, let's get it guys, you know? So have your community. I mean, I know that's something you're passionate about, Abby, like have your community, like find that one person who wants to stand up for what's right, to be a person of moral value of, to be a person who fights for the vulnerable in the womb um, and, and let that person, you know, got, get your back. Like, even if, you know, you're doing things separately, like at least, you know, you're in it together. And I think that also really helps when you're facing attacks. Yeah, I love that you talk really more about finding the positive and focusing on the positive and focusing on why you're fighting as opposed to, you know, well, when I get hate comments, I I feel bad and these are the things that I do. No, 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 there's actually a reason why I get the hate comments. And that's yeah. because I'm doing something important. And I think that's... And they, and they Oh, go ahead. No, I just, I think that that's inspiring is to recognize why, why that's coming towards you. And so it, in a way it can, it can feel like you are, depending on how you want to view it, bolstered by it because it means you're doing something right. <laughs> right. And I think that, you know, those people do not determine your value. And if you're getting flack for something, it could be because maybe you're being a jerk and you could be nicer. I mean, it's good to, I'm not a believer in like never read the negative comments. I actually don't believe that. I think some people are well-intentioned and sharing something and, and you should consider what other people say. But there's a lot of anger and vitriol because if you're speaking the truth and it means it, it's it's convicting people, it's pricking consciences, right? Um, we all need that sometimes. And you get, you're going to get blowback. And that's where, you know, you're actually you're actually loving those people by speaking for what's right and standing up for what's right. You know, we, we don't want to allow the lie to continue. If there's a lie about human value or dignity or sexuality, by being silent, you're not loving other people. And sometimes by speaking lovingly, you can create controversy or even anger, but that's ultimately maybe that person's journey. They have to go through an angry time. Maybe they need to hate you or think that they hate you, you know, for a period of time. But what you said is still somewhere in their head or heart, you know, and maybe it'll come around to them later in life or, you know, weeks or months later where they're like, mm, you know, a life experience or something will change for them. And, you know, that troll on the internet, you might have actually helped that troll, you know, <laughs> um, or helped that person acting like a troll. So I think that's another aspect of it that is important to remember. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. This was fantastic. Thank you, Abby. Thanks for having me and thanks for everything you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, make sure all of my subscribers, make sure to give Lila Rose a follow on all social media. I'm going to link her below. I'm going to link live action below as well. Make sure to check out her podcast and her new book, Fighting for Life. So thank you again for coming on and I hope to have you on again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Abby. 
Thank you guys so much for watching today's episode of Let's Be Classic. It was wonderful having Lila on. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell if you'd like to see more interviews just like this. Head to the description box to subscribe to my Substack newsletter and get access to exclusive content not available anywhere else at classicallyabby.substack.com. If you'd like to follow me on social media, it's at Classically Abby absolutely everywhere. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!